Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Polish Dev Diary, part 2 of Peasants and Kings. But before we start covering all the interesting new alternate history focuses for Poland in their new focus tree, I just wanted to mention that only a quarter of you are actually subscribed to my YouTube channel. So, if you enjoy or find my videos interesting and want to support me, the best way you can do it is by subscribing and watching the video till the very end. But enough about that, let's get talking about Poland. So while last week covered the free update coming to Poland, this week we'll be covering the DLC content for the unannounced DLC coming with 1.11 Barbarossa. This week the Dev Diary is split into its four key sections. The Communist Path, the Monarchist Path, the Fash Path, and the Government in Exile Path, and we'll be taking all of those in that order. So, as many of us predicted, the Peasants' Strike and forming the Peasants' Union will be doable in the next DLC. By organising the peasant strike, we begin the path towards civil war and allowing the country to decide whether it wants to become communist or democracy. As we progress down the focus tree, we'll have more focuses that give us the ability to decide how powerful we're going to be when the inevitable civil war takes place. As we can see here, this works very similarly to how the Spanish Civil War works, with each focus powering up ourselves for the civil war that's inevitably coming. You have limited amount of time to do this, I think they said roughly a year, so yeah, very similar to the Spanish Civil War. So as we see here with the armed peasant militia, each time we do a focus, we get more support for the communists by five. Once you eventually have 50 support for the communists, you can launch the Civil War. As well as gaining influence through the focuses, you also have on-map decisions to try and make it so that as many states prior to the Civil War, you can collect so when the war actually begins, you have them in your full control, and hopefully the borders will be much more in your favour. You start off by trying to go for the agricultural based states, as we see here with sort of the Belarus and uh, Ukrainian areas, but then once you take them, you can head more west and try to go for the industrialised areas. Another way you'll be trying to win the civil war is by trying to convince your generals to side on the peasants. In doing so, you'll give them the peasant sympathiser trait, which means they'll be on your side when the civil war begins. And then, once all is done, the time has come, and that lovely green we now see before us rises from the fields to fight down nationalist Poland. I have to say, I'm a big fan of them uh, taking the Spanish Civil War, like, state-picking mechanic to really let you customise how you think the civil war should go. It kind of makes me feel this is something that should be a standard for all civil wars in the game, but I feel that might be too complicated to fully implement. So it's at this point you're basically going to have to decide whether you're going down the more democratic path or the more communist path, the democracies leading to siding with the Allies and the communist path siding roughly with the Soviets. Starting with the Soviets, your first choice is whether you're going to work with them directly or go with an anti-Stalinist candidate as your chairman to try and carve your own way in Eastern Europe. The key point being, if you align yourself with the Soviets, you will have to surrender Eastern Poland to them, but that could allow you to do more opportunities later on. I'm particularly interested by the Greater Polish SSR, which makes me think, are you allowed to become like one of the key components of the Soviet Union? On the flip side, you could go down democracy, as we can see here, taking its own path with the Morges Pact. The Dev Diary describes it as being equivalent to a Polish-led Little Entente, where you start by trying to side with the French and opening it up to expanding the faction to defeat the Germans. They also note that going down this path opens up the Between the Seas branch, which is the faction building branch that let you invite Scandinavia and other countries to your factions including possibly Italy. The Morges Pact is very strong. The central option is the anti-imperialism, which effectively means that the peasants do not side with the Democrats or the Communists and choose their own way. In this, you'll basically have no friends, but you will get powerful bonuses for dismantling the capitalist empires, the fascist empires, and the Soviet empire. Because who needs friends, am I right? And the final option, which we can see here, is preserving the bourgeoisie democracy, which is effectively suggesting that siding with Britain to destroy the uh, central Reich power is probably the most important thing Poland could be doing, 
considering they're right on your border. This is pretty much your standard, I'm democratic Poland, please let me join the allies path. But what's really important is suddenly you can become a colonial power. In this path, and also in the Morges Pact path, you have the ability to start asking for colonies to strengthen yourself up, specifically Liberia and the Polish Colonial League. If you go down the Morges Pact, as we can see here, you have the option to purchase Madagascar of all places. Who knew that the Peasants' Union's priority would be becoming a colonial power? I, I generally don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> Regardless of which path you went down, with faction or going it alone, the final option will be for you to create the Commonwealth of Socialist Republics, which is this very tall looking country that we see here. But enough about that, it's time to talk about what really matters, the Polish monarchy. And it begins in quite an unassuming way, with you simply having to assemble a regency council to fulfil the 5th of November Act. The 5th of November Act was an unachieved promise that the central powers would create a Kingdom of Poland, but unfortunately they failed to crown a king before the Second Polish Republic had been formed, so one of those unachieved things on the to-do list, I suppose. Regardless, once you've done those two focuses, it does appear that you straight away start as the Kingdom of Poland. It's at that point that you have to decide between three available monarchs. Now, they did say that technically there should have been more options, and thinking about it, having a Habsburg option would possibly have made more sense. But regardless, what three options we have are the Holozolan, or Romanian option, the Commonwealth Claimant, which is the most probable one, and the Cossack King, which is completely mental. So, let's go into it. So the Commonwealth Claim is that of Frederick Christian, who they claim is to be the most preferred candidate for King. The perks of going with Frederick Christian is the ability to form an alliance with Lithuania and peacefully annex them to create the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. That was formerly a formable nation with Waking the Tiger, so I don't know if they've removed the formable nation or if it's still there. By going down the focus tree, you'll open up the decisions for their claim on Lithuania, which effectively gives you options to both start a civil war in Lithuania for the monarchists or peacefully annex them using some careful diplomacy. It's important to note when looking back at the focus tree that there is an optional seek an alliance with the Kaiser, so there is some alternative history German Kaiser path that you could follow if you go down this path. If forming the Polish-Lithuania Commonwealth isn't to your liking, there is a much larger option available in the form of the Intermerium. By going down the Romanian Holozolan path, you will have option to get Michael II of Romania. If you're able to get King Michael on the throne of Poland, and get to Romania to also get King Michael on the throne, you can unite the two and form the Kingdom of Poland-Romania. And might I say, look at this empire, look at the size of it. Um, effectively, you are now the bloc between Germany and the Soviets. If I just had one criticism I have to bring up about this though, why is Czechoslovakia still called Czechoslovakia when they don't own Slovakia? It seems to be a reoccurring problem with this game. They just need to be called the Czech Republic. Never mind. In all seriousness though, you do get cores on all of Poland and Romania, so you are a manpower giant at this point. So hopefully defending against both sides of the Germany and the Soviets isn't going to be too difficult. I say afraid. On the off chance you don't want to form Poland-Hungary though, and I have no idea why you wouldn't want to, there is a more tame option to appoint a pro-allied government and just simply join the Allies. And I guess that works too. And finally we have the third option, Pavel the Cossack King. So in my ignorance I wasn't really sure who Pavel was, but the dev diary describes him as a warlord, a Cossack and a Georgian prince. So following in his path as a warlord, this focus tree basically involves going to war with every single person you can. Um, it involves demanding Lithuania, demanding the Baltics, demanding Slovakia, and then just going after Germany because why not? On the flip side, you do have the option of not going against Germany and seeking an alignment with them. Um, but the real question I have is what is the Bermontonian mission at the bottom? And what is the end result of it? Because it looks a little bit scary. Regardless, if you are looking for the ultimate warlord chaos path, the Cossack King is probably your choice. 
And finally, this brings us to the Fasch and Nationalist path. The key point of this branch is deciding between two key factions, the Falange and the National Democrats. As you push between one and the other, you eventually decide on which one you want, and then use them to overthrow the current government and follow through with their policies. So, if you choose to go down the National Democrat path, you'll effectively be going down the path of appeasement so that Germany doesn't invade you in 1939. Unfortunately, this does involve becoming a German puppet and having to surrender Danzig and Poznan to them before eventually becoming their subservient petty thing. After that point, it's up to you to decide what you want to do. Your options include working with Germany to defeat the Soviets and eventually getting the ability to perhaps get cause on Soviet territory, becoming an even stronger puppet for the Germans. Or you can work from within, slowly trying to destroy the Germans from within and then get your own independence in a massive war for independence. On the flip side, we have the Falange path, which does not wish to bow to Germany and instead pursues its own goals of a Polish Catholic faction known as the Falangist International. The Falangist International takes the position of trying to gather as many Falangists in the world into one mega faction, and where better to start than the Spanish Civil War? Assuming the right has won, you can support global phalangism to get them in your faction. From there, you have a series of decisions to find places that historically had some aspects of phalangism in their government and try to get them in your faction. These include the Benelux, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And because Poland seems to be obsessed with Lithuania, you have again have the option to whether you choose to ally Lithuania or go to war with them. It says here it's important to note that if you choose to annex them, you'll be locked out of the Between the Seas path, which was the branch that allows you to build a mega faction. So I don't really see why you'd ever want to go after Lithuania when that faction branch was so powerful. But apart from that, that's the key points to the Falanges path. It's effectively just trying to build as big a faction as possible. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there could be more to it than that. But hey, it's just a faction tree. What can I say? <laughs> so with all of the ideological paths done, it's time for one bonus focus tree branch that wasn't covered last week. Since Poland historically does get capitulated in 1939, and it's relatively difficult to try and stop it, the best thing you can do is prepare for the inevitable if you think you're going to fail. The Prepare for the Inevitable branch is effectively adding on to the government in exile that was added in the previous DLC. In doing so, you'll have access to some new leaders, including these very powerful ones here that give you legitimacy gain, weekly exiled government manpower, all that good stuff. You'll also have access to Irene Anders, somebody who else who also gives you legitimacy gain and more weekly manpower. This collection of manpower feels like they're just wanting you to capitulate but constantly be able to build new units and try and come back from the grave. Equally, because Poland doesn't have a colonial empire to which to hide itself, you have the Exile Industries focus, which gives you some sieves and mills so you can keep producing equipment while you're trapped on the British shoreline. Equally, if you have Le Resistance DLC, you have the Expand Polish Intelligence, which means you can create a massive spy network with two additional operative slots as well as the codebreaker Marianne. With those two new operatives, you'll be able to do the reworked Warsaw Uprising, which now has the ability to happen slightly sooner than previously would have been allowed. Having access to this much easier to do Warsaw Uprising could be the difference between cutting off the German supply as they enter the Soviets for Operation Barbarossa. And the final and possibly most controversial focus of the XL branch is the Atomics Physics Institute, which gives you a quite simple nuclear technology, but also an off-map nuclear reactor, which some people seem to think is extremely overpowered. I will say that it doesn't really make sense why the Polish government in exile um, government has able to create an off-map nuclear reactor, but at the same time, it doesn't give you the ability to launch nukes, and it is only one, which is effectively one nuke per year, so it's not extremely overpowered. It's just a bit strange, isn't it? Regardless, I am sure you'll have your own opinions about what you think about that focus, and many of the other focuses here. But that's all for this week, so thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, I hope this was somewhat informative, and um, if you liked, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.
Bye.